Hi, it seems that DOS had nearly as many completely unknown and forgotten games as it did those that were rather well known. Today we'll talk about another 10 of the earlier, so let's jump straight in. Thor's Hammer is a first-person perspective fantasy team shower shooter with some very superficial RPG element. And when I say very superficial, I mean you'll need a magnifying glass and a whole little detective set to find any proof of its inclusion, but we'll get to that later. So, after years of peace and prosperity, the proverbial shadow of the great evil befell upon your homeland, signifying the dawn of the dark times. To change the future and prevent the catastrophe from happening, a hero must once again rely on legendary Thor's Hammer. As per usual, that hero is you. It should come as no surprise, cause as we know from Marvel's movies, only Thor, Captain America and you can hold it. Thor's Hammer is composed out of three episodes, the trial, the journey and the battle. Pretty self-explanatory if you ask me. And only the first is available in the shareware version. The weapons that you'll get to use are mainly of melee kind and spells, they're nothing special or extraordinary like Thor's Hammer, but can be upgraded at least to keep that feeling of progression going. So, running in a large room like a deranged barbarian with a huge axe and death in your eyes, putting down groups of zombies in rage-filled psychosis is nothing special. And something that you'll be doing quite often. Well, often as in in each of the episodes, not often as in all the time. Because as FPSs go, Thor's Hammer has surprisingly few enemies. In fact, I'd risk saying that it's a decent first FPS for someone who doesn't play games in the genre and is not that set on weapons having to be rifles, as it's easy enough for anyone to enjoy and complete. Especially that it features an auto map, so they won't get lost in it. And it's a feature that many much bigger commercial titles didn't have. Enemies are quite varied and anything, from different kinds of humanoids, so soldiers, knights and wizards, all the way to zombies, bats and vampire-like creatures that attack with their eyes. I don't know how to explain it better, they shine their eyes at you and it hurts inside. It's like they're judging you. It's weird. You don't earn experience or money in Thor's Hammer, but you get to find and talk to NPCs for hints, so that's the aforementioned RPG elements. Thor's Hammer is not great, but it's not terrible either, so it's up to you to decide if you want to play it or not. The Walls of Bratok is one of the best shower turn-based DOS RPGs. No, really, it is. Surprisingly good, in fact. Its death, story, gameplay mechanics, all were of the highest quality and only the graphics were an indicator that it was not a game supported by a large publisher and done by someone with heaps of imagination and will to see it through. But it's hardly graphics that make or break the game, and we should know, because we mainly talk about old games here. So, don't let the 1980s presentation fool you, Walls of Bratok is great. It takes place on an island of Bratok, which is consumed by conflict. Conflict that hardly anyone remembers the genesis of. You play as a hero who's been led to the island by a premonition that came to him in a dream, saying that he's the one, nay, the only one who can prevent the bloodshed and save Bratok. The game world is rather huge for sure, a release featuring 10 multi-level cities, villages and keeps, over 30 huge dungeons filled with different monsters to the brim, as in with them spilling to the outside world too. The plot is rather interesting as well and features more than one twist, so it's quite fun to follow an experience. If you're looking at the game and thinking, Hey there, buddy boy. Though, why would you call me buddy boy, I don't know. I don't mind, let's make that clear, but also don't understand it. Anyway, hey there, buddy boy, I've seen it before, isn't it one of those maximum games? I mean, ultimum games? I mean, ultima games? Well, no, but also kinda yes. While The Walls of Bratok had nothing to do with Richard Garriott or Origin Systems directly, it was inspired by the classic Ultima series. And as inspirations go, this one paid off. And The Walls of Bratok is very solid and well put together. Also, Shara version was basically a full game, short of few small extra bits and pieces that were totally unnecessary to complete the game. So there's that. If you like RPGs, get it. Fred is a top-down sci-fi arcade action shooter and easily one of the best shower games of 1995. Humans have always been dreaming of space. We thought about it long before we had planes, before we landed on the moon, before Twitter was renamed to X, it waited on our imaginations, fueling it with ideas and hopes for the mankind. So, establishing of the colony city Astral on a far-off mineral-rich asteroid was a huge achievement, and we were happy. The dream was fulfilled, right? First step and all. Well, quite unfortunately, the colony city was overtaken by the aggressive and deadly aliens, who came there and took it. 
Yep, just like that. No pleases, no thank yous, no kiss my asses, nothing. They just took it. Now, if you've ever seen a random gym goer's Instagram feed, you should know to never give up, to follow your dreams, to keep on fighting, to never stop never stopping, and most importantly, to never ever ever skip the leg day. Wiser words have never been spoken. So you and few white coat and glasses wearing buddies of yours took the coats down, grabbed the nearest guns you could find, fixed your glasses and decided to take the colony back. Fred is a super fun top-down arcade shooter for up to three players. Which if I was to compare it to anything else you'd know or heard of, I'd say that it's most similar to alien breed games, but with bigger levels, full 360 degrees rotation and fog of war. And it's that small and seemingly insignificant change, fog of war, that makes a whole lot of difference and keeps you on the edge of your seat constantly, ready to shoot, 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 cause you never know from where and how many aliens will pop out. Also regular enemies too. But you know that they will. You know, it's edited, cause originally I said that you never know how many aliens would poop out, which may not be correct, but if you imagine it, it's way more fun than whatever I came up here with. Fortunately, you're not armed with staple guns and get to pick up various bonuses and money for killing aliens, which then can be spent between the levels in the store for a wide choice of deadly firearms and explosives. Fred may not be the best looking or sounding game in today's video, but I'd risk saying that it's most likely the most fun. If you play it with others, that is. Being as ignorant as I am and not knowing Dutch or willing to use Google Translate, I can only assume that our next game is pronounced or something similar. Okay, that's not good enough and offensive to people of the green country, so let me try again. Tazin had milio. Better? Well, that's the best I can do. I tried. It's gotta count for something, right? Anyway, the Tazin, the game, is kinda like Oregon Trail, but without the family members, without the dangers and with no travel whatsoever. In fact, all the travel you'll be doing is between different rooms of your house and the yard. Sounds out? Well, it's an edutainment kind of a game, so you can't expect heaps of action or deep multi-layered plot full of twists, turns and cliffhanger moments. Oh, it's gotta be pointed out that it only ever came out in Dutch, so I've never played it myself. But if you did, please let me know if it's any good. Anyway, it's all about ecology and living your eco-friendly life. So you'll be performing series of tasks in and around the house, like controlling the radiators, cleaning, throwing out the trash, taking showers, naturally conserving water, going to the bathroom and doing laundry. So, exactly like Sims, but all the least fun parts of Sims. Whenever you're doing any of the oh-so-exciting tasks, you'll be asked environmental in nature questions. And at the end of the week, you are evaluated on how well you've conserved energy and how much you've helped with saving of the environment. The idea is interesting, the questions surely explain the idu in the edutainment, but is it worth checking out in the end? Honestly, I don't know. Oregon Trail was, so maybe this has some fun factor there too, hidden between recycling of beer cans and composting yard leaves in a language my as smooth as baby's bottom brain never grasped, you make up your own mind about it. Remember Wipeout and how fun it was? Also fast, hella fast and action-packed. Remember? What a game. Well, Thunder Offshore is like that. Only divided in half and takes place on water and other liquids and not on regular tracks. So, half the fun, half the speed, half the action and half of presentation. If you keep in mind how amazing Wipeout was, it means that Thunder Offshore has got to be pretty decent at least, right? And yeah, it actually is. It's a futuristic motorboat arcade racer built out of 15 circuits in water, lava, acid and other unpleasant liquid substances. It features different boats to choose from, all with their unique power, handling and looks, and over 10 weapons to lay destruction to your opponent. Anything from lasers to torpedoes. But beware, cue the menacing music here, editor. Thank you, you're not the only one versed in use of such gear, and opposing racers will no doubt try to take you out too. The sensation of speed is not Thunder Offshore's strongest suit, which is a bit disappointing in a racer, and while the tracks look nice and all, you never feel as if you were speeding at an incredible pace. So it's a bit easier game than Wipeout. One thing that is rather annoying would be how your motorboat behaves whenever it collides with anything or floats over solid ground. It just feels out and breaks the immersion entirely, looking as if all the gravity failed and was not a constant but alternating with each micro difference in terrain height. It's not game breaking in any way, but definitely very, very annoying. Thunder Truck Rally is an arcade 3D monster truck racer. 
and as much as I don't care about the sport, it was made by Reflections for Psygnosis, so folks who made both Destruction Derby games, so you know, it pretty much guaranteed equality there. I mean, when have we ever heard of the company that made amazing, like genre-defining games for a while and then stopped by releasing a terrible, awful abomination of a title, Bethesda? Um, I'm, 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 I meant no one in particular, really. Anyway, TTR, which I will call it from this point onward, saving like a second or two at most each time I do and just barely making up for all the time lost explaining it here and now, is actually pretty fun. It features all the standard for the races game modes of championship, which is like a career of monstering and tracking, then the time trial, practice and multiplayer. There is also a separate car crashing competition, but it also pops up from time to time in championship as a bonus, and this one's all about fun. And points, but mostly fun. There are 9 different tracks to pick from and they're all different stats, but it's your typical spread between stronger but slower and faster but less fragile, with all the others in between. Well, I'm obviously grossly oversimplifying as there's also acceleration and turning there, but you get what I mean, right? Sure you do, you're you, so like one of 5 people in the universe with IQ over 9000. You're so smart in fact, that when you begin thinking about something, like really giving it your best, getting them brain cells working, your brain goes at it so hard that the temperature in the room that you're in instantly jumps up a few degrees. That's you. But let's get back to our game. There are two types of races in TTR. First takes place in an open arena where you have to race from point to point in the fastest possible time. And there are also circuits, which are on fixed tracks that cannot be escaped or the borders crossed in any way. In this, you aim to complete the circuit as fast as possible. Overall, TTR is a rather fun game, especially for the fans of its specific offshoot of the racing genre. So why is it in this video at all? Well, Monster Truck Madness came out two years prior and its successor did in 1998, same as TTR. And simply put, they were much better games. Tiger Road is a fantasy-themed horizontally scrolling beat-em-up that originated in the arcades and then was ported to other systems of the time, thus being one of them. You play as Lee Wong, a warrior monk who has to rescue children kidnapped by the evil Emperor Yu Ken. You start with a short-range axe, which is not terrible in itself but can eventually be switched to either faster but lower-range spear or slower but longer-range spike bow. All of them have their ups and downs and most of them can be upgraded by picking up POW icons, as in power-up and not prisoner of war. Even more so, breaking golden statues reveals other power-ups which can be different useful things, so stuff like stopping time, increasing your life meter or even screen clearing of all the monsters among others. Most levels score horizontally and throw enemies at you from both sides, but some also have small arcade challenges incorporated straight into their design, like a collapsing bridge where you need to jump over falling platforms not to fall down into a spiky pit and the likes. You won't get bored in Tiger Road is what I'm saying, and going through the game will definitely feel as if you were progressing, even if it will be incredibly short progress. All because DOS version is not only considerably shorter than the arcade original, consisting of only few stages culminating with the final boss fight, but also uses EGA presentation in one of the worst ways I've seen, with colors mixed in a way that it looks as if someone just gave a 5 year old a set of colors and told to color the game in to his slash her heart's content. And whatever you wanna say, most 5 year olds are not artists. Anyway, so that you don't think I'm done complaining, scrolling is another bug of problems that should never have been opened. And it's as choppy as you would have expected from a title that got close to no playtesting at all. Not saying that it's the case, but it seems very feasible. Overall, Tiger Road in the arcades was really fun and action packed. When played on DOS, Tiger Road is. Yup, that is precisely how I wanna end talking about it. Tilt is a rather fun action puzzler which feels like a mixture of Marble Madness, Pipe Mania and one of those games where you slide square pieces to form a complete image. Your goal is to get the ball from start to the end and you do so by navigating often quite convoluted maze, moving a ball through it. It's hardly ever a maze that's complete from the get-go, so you also have to rearrange board's layout by creating a path for the ball, sliding tiles to construct a feasible path for it. As you do just that, like a boss I must add, using but a fraction of your mental processing powers you also have to collect randomly appearing pickups and avoid any and all obstacles like magnets, red buttons, stop signs, holes and other traps. Naturally, the levels are timed, so completing them as fast as possible is not only advisable, but also influences your end level bonus. Tilt is pretty fun, especially if you like puzzlers. And the fact that it comes with the included level editor makes it even more long lasting and enjoyable than it would have been otherwise. There's also a simultaneous cooperative two player mode, but I've not had a chance to play it, so I can't vouch for how fun it is. 
I can only imagine that with one player controlling the ball and the other working on the board, it can be hella fun. I mean, most multiplayer games are, right? Time Bandit is a gauntlet clone with some simple text adventure elements here and there, scattered over its rather robust 16 worlds, split into 214 individual levels. Yep, it's a pretty big and fun one. The title is not misleading, the time travel team is in the forefront of the gameplay and your nameless bandit protagonist visits 16 different lands throughout the time, trying to find and grab as much loot as possible, eventually working your way to saving the universe too, because of course that there's hidden plot there. The worlds are rather different and interesting too. So, you'll get to travel to places like a ghost town, medieval arena, wrecked spaceship and a bomb factory to name a few. Now, I did mention that Time Bandit is similar to Gauntlet, so apart from treasures, there are also keys to open locked off areas and a lot of enemies to defeat. They are quite varied in their design, but in Time Bandit's spiritual ancestor style, also pretty easy to kill. Every now and then, you will encounter a NPC or a computer console and this will offer some superficial interaction possibilities and some simple tasks to perform. Time Bandit, while very similar to Gauntlet, is also quite different from it too, so it's a genre bender type of a game and as such, it's fun to experience and even more so to play with a friend. Not to mention the epic title, which could be a base for a decent temporal heist badly written book with an unsatisfying ending or a graphic novel with terrible art. The possibilities are endless. In the near future, an advanced computerized combat simulation was created for the use of military, with aim of teaching the participants various different combat forms found throughout human history. This stupid ass plot must have made sense in 1996, today it's not even good enough to base a B-movie on, not to mention a game. But don't let the shallow story discourage you from playing, Time Commando is not a bad game. One of the simulation's developers is against the general idea of the project and seeks to destroy it. And what's a better way to do it than with a computer virus? It's simple, it's clean and most importantly fast to pull off. The ADA is sound, but as per usual when something seems like a given, something else went astray and the virus mutated and created a dimensional vortex that threatens to swallow the entire world. You play as Stanley Opar, a member of the so-called SAFE, so special action for virus elimination unit, who enters the vortex with a goal of destroying a virus before the universe is destroyed. Before the universe is. Stanley Opar travels into eight different time periods, prehistoric, Roman, feudal Japan, medieval, conquistador, wild west, modern wars and future. Each of those eras is thematically entirely different, featuring unique enemies and sets of weapons. Time Commando is a 3D action adventure in which you control a full 3D polygonal character against 3D enemies in a pre-rendered 3D looking but not really being environments. It plays kinda like Alone in the Dark but features many more open areas and is tad more action packed with a lot of combat on the forefront of everything that you'll be doing. Stanley has 3 attacking moves and a block and while it may not seem like a lot, they change depending on the weapons that you use. And part of the challenge comes from picking the right weapon to use against a particular enemy. You can increase the size of your life bar via in-game fun pickups and raise the time limit that's constantly ticking down by depositing picked up while playing computer chips into a special orb pools that are found in the levels every now and then. As early 3D polygonal games on pre-rendered backgrounds go, Time Commando is good. I'm not a big fan of pre-rendered backgrounds, I'm sure I've complained about them in at least a dozen videos to date, but I can overlook them here as Time Commando is pretty decent. How do you find today's selection? Good? Meat? Something in between? Well, make sure to let me know in the comments below. Also, have you seen Fallout yet? What do you think about it? As a long fan of the series, I can't help but love it, especially that it's chock full of little flavors that the non-familiar with the lore would never notice. As a matter of fact, a work friend of mine actually hated it. She usually likes sci-fi TV series and movies, but said that she won't be able to finish Fallout as it's too weird and makes close to no sense. She is not the most patient person out there, I'll give you that, and tends to overlook minute details. But as I was watching it, I thought at times that it may be difficult to follow for someone who has no background knowledge in Fallout whatsoever. Especially why the vaults are different from one another, what's so special about them, what happened exactly on the outside and such. Robots, tech and armors are pretty straightforward, so they were not an issue. All that said, I've took it upon myself to spend an hour at work last week to explain all the lore, history and what were the vaults and experiments all about, told her about all the main factions and after I was done, she said she's gonna try watching it again. Because now, at least she knows what she's watching and that it's not quote unquote stupid anymore. Like I said, I loved it. Is it the best series I've seen this year so far? Nope, that would still be the bear, but Fallout is definitely a close second. Also, it was renewed for the second season literally hours after premiering, so perhaps more people loved it than I thought. 
What do you think though? Let's discuss it in the comments below. If you like the video, hit those like and subscribe buttons below. Smash them if you have to, it helps more than you could ever know. Also, I would like to thank you and all my amazing Patreon and YouTube members for helping this channel keep going. And last but definitely not least, I would like to thank all the wonderful folks who record and upload playthroughs, let's plays and other retrocentric videos here on YouTube, because they help to preserve the games that would have otherwise belong forgotten. So thank you.